Our meeting to order, it's 710, sorry, 810. Um, sorry, because I didn't really review the agenda a lot. Hold on one second. Okay. Sorry. Oh, that makes, yeah. All right, uh, so chance for public comments at the beginning of our meeting. Um, I don't see anybody else on the line. Uh, for participants, no, there's no one else. Sean's on, Jamie's on. Obviously, Rebecca's here in the audience. We do have, I don't know if we want to move Robin over to a panelist, but we've got Robin and then Kevin Patron is the other attendee that's in the Zoom. Sure. Oh, I'm sorry, the, the two attendees. You're just trying to move us well, this quickly, and you're like, <laughs> no, 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 no. I just said just move Robin over to panelist. So, Kevin, unless you have any questions, uh, we'll move on. I think you're the only one in the audience. All right, obviously the agenda tonight is primarily to discuss uh, this one page that we received, um, our missive on Friday afternoon uh, from the state. Um, obviously, threatening to take away what we had already uh, approved at our last meeting. Um, and then I, th we, I think we need to decide what we're going to do here as far as dealing with some of the facilities upgrades that we have. Um, I think if you don't mind, maybe I'll just start off really quick just to make sure that we all kind of understand what we're dealing with here because I've spent pretty much all of the past two days going through these numbers again and just trying to figure out, you know, really what is happening to us. So. Maybe I'll just give you guys a couple quick facts just to make sure um, that we're all on the same page here. Um, sorry, let me just pull up a couple pieces here that I put together. So, so the facts are, so if we were to keep our education spending flat from last year, okay, so not do anything, just do the exact same budget, not increase it to 3.9% that we've decided to increase it this year, which is obviously based primarily on the three years of the teacher contracts, the health care and whatnot. Um, but if you just were to keep it flat, our tax rate is going to go up by 29%, okay, without any other increases. And actually, it could be about 33% based on the new base rate that this state has since updated us with. If you include the expenditures, that number jumps to 36%, and I think it could be actually 40% um, if you include the new base rate. Okay, so we're talking, you know, and, and this is just from... Yes, uh, it, it, when you say include the expenditures, you mean what we already approved? Right. Okay, thank you. 3.9, not, not right. the excess, not, right. not the facilities, but just our base. Right. Call it. I think we okay. should keep that clear tonight that... We have our base budget that was the 3.9%, okay. which is what we've been, that budget has not changed now for, gosh, I think, like two months. Okay. That's been, right. that's been the number. Okay, thank um, you. Now, again, if we, if we want to keep the rate flat, presuming we had an identical budget to last year, we have to cut 3.1 million. If we wanted to keep the rate flat based on our current budget, which is really what we would have to cut because it's with the existing heads and the salaries and whatnot, we got to cut 3.8 million. So, and the other number that I calculated today too, if we wanted to cut so that we had the same tax rate increase as what the rest of Vermont has on average, which was back, you may remember, but we got a letter from the Commissioner of Taxes just before Thanksgiving, I believe, that was talking about an 18%, eight, almost a 20% increase, so I think it was 18.5% across the state. If we want to make our tax rate increase 18.8% like everyone else, we have to cut 2.2 million out of our budget. And then I started going back and saying, okay, how are we going to cut, let's even just cut something. So the only way we can cut really is to start reducing class sizes and laying people off. Increasing class sizes. Increasing class, increasing class, increasing class sizes. So if we were to revise our sections to get all the sections to basically be in line with the state statutes, which are... 20 kids, an average or fewer than 20 kids for K through 3, 
and she'll average fewer than 25 through 4 through 12, we would only be able to cut three sections at Marion Cross. So that means only cutting three teachers, which on the average cost, if you look at our budget and divide it by the full-time regular ed teachers, it's about 116,000, and that includes all the other textbooks. And that's way overstated. You're talking 350 grand. Now, if we wanted to cut even more, which basically would mean cutting everyone's classes to one section, so our average class size would be 42 kids, we could cut 12 teachers, which would be 1.4 million. Halfway. So we're halfway to 2.2 to get to the 18. We're nowhere near the 3.8. So I think the point here is is that. I mean, again, I've spent the past two days thinking through this, and I mean, I know we've got, the state thinks we I just have a bunch of rich white kids indoors, but like increasing class sizes to 42 kids to be able to get our budget down doesn't seem like there's something wrong with the formula that we're not, there's something wrong with the formula, the new weightings formula, the fact that our taxes are going up by 40, 30 to 40 percent. I. I don't know what it is. Um, I think next up, you know, so that's that fact. I think the second thing, so I have sent some emails. I, you know, Rebecca's kindly come to join us tonight, too, to give us some insights on, you know, what's going on. Um, I mean, I have sent, just so people are aware, that I've sent some emails to VSBA to, um, to, um, What's her name? Who's the Cormier? Who's the uh, Emily? The, the, Representative the, Kornheiser. Kornheiser. Um, and I'll just read you that as well, just because I think this is kind of where I'm coming from at the moment. So, you know, I wrote that as you all may know, I'm the, currently the chair of the Norris School Board. I've been on the school board for four years and I'm due to run for another two year term in March. I said being on the school board is a big reason why I've spent so much of time, my time trying to brainstorm additional sources of tax revenue for the state of Vermont. So given the, the dire financial situation at the state level and the fact that Norwich is facing a 36% tax rate increase, I'm hesitant to continue on the select board. Um, I cannot re imagine receiving the um, blowback from the town residents starting next year. I said this is particularly uh, true as the state has put the town in an impossible situation. There's no way for Norwich to cut our way out of this. We would need to cut 3.8 million or seven out of our elementary school budget. And then I, you know, I talked about the fact that even if we were to cut a million, it would result in a massive teacher layoffs, about 10 teachers, reducing our staff by about a third, doubling most class sizes, a little above the state uh, statutes. Um, and this type of cut, presuming that we're even allowed to do that, will profoundly change the school. Um, I think that the 5% cap, you know, I think we have to remember that this is a bit of a misnomer. It simply delays the inevitable. And because it's calculated before the CLA, Norwich is still facing a 16% tax rate increase this year, even with the cap. This after growing our total educational expenditures an average of only 4% over the past six years, which is really important for us to keep in mind here as we're thinking about cutting this budget further, and only including only 3.9% this year, right, despite the impact of three years' worth of our teacher contracts and settlements. In fact, our per pupil spending this year is flat, right? It's up $2. Um, the other half of our budget is Dresden, uh, the Hanover High and Richmond Middle School, which for which we as Norris School Board have zero ability to cut, given Norris does not have the Dresden School Board votes. Hanover residents, meanwhile, are looking at a 2.6% tax increase this year. <clears throat> Unfortunately, I moved to, to Norris 10 years ago. There are about a dozen classmates from Tuck Dartmouth Business School who also called Norwich home. Fast forward today, but all but two have left. Vermont's broken fiscal situation has made them realize the incentives to stay in Vermont are being erased. Soon it makes, zero, it, it will make zero sense to live here. I was hoping that something could be done in the 11th hour to allow for a more reasonable implementation of Act 127. But looking at the staggering tax rate increase we're facing and zero ability to help our school or residents, I do not believe there's a positive future for Norwich. So I apologize for, you know, Starting this off, I do applaud the efforts of the legislature for trying to, you know, make the education of, or, you know, prioritize the education of the children here in Vermont, but I think it's become abundantly clear that Vermont does not have the financial resources to achieve every goal that's desired. Um, so I think from here we can, that those were kind of my statements. I just want to make sure that we were all clear with our facts and numbers. Um, 
as we know tonight, whatever we decide to add to the budget is not going to change our tax rate. I think maybe I can turn it over to Neil. I think at this point, <clears throat> we really are making a decision as far as making the state representatives happy and not annoying them because I think the fear that we all have is that if we play by the rules, which they had given us last time, that they are likely, it sounds like they're threatened to cut the 5% cap next year through legislative process, which would obviously be somewhat devastating to us, although I'm a little bit like, I guess I'm already doing the calculations figuring that our taxes are going up by 30, 36 to 40% anyways. Um, so I don't know if that really makes a big deal to me. Um, <clears throat> I have reached out to Jay as well, asking for, and again, I think we should talk tonight if we want to add some uh, legal fees into the budget a bit, because I would like, I, I think we should have Leopold look at the Dresden Norwich Compact and just see if there's something in there. Um, I do think the one question, unfortunately, and Jamie, maybe I'll ask you this question. Is there a way for us to calculate how much taxes we generate in Norwich, including income sensitivity? Because I have, on one hand, we keep talking about the fact that we have no poverty, but it, I also read emails that the majority of residents in both Thetford and Hanover pay through income sensitivity. So, Thetford and Norwich. I'm sorry, Thetford and Norwich. <laughs> So that kind of like doesn't balance to me. And I don't know, I'm, it, it's really hard to think about how this all works because we have no idea how much taxes we actually generate because we have no idea who pays, how much we pay through income sensitivity and what that is. But <clears throat> I don't want to take the meeting off a track that it's just hard to make these decisions about whether we start looking at the compact and other ways to get around this at some point. But anyways, that's, maybe we can put that aside for a few minutes and then. <clears throat> I think it was Rebecca's email that had the majority of Norwich residents paying for any yeah. sensitivity, so yeah. hopefully there's the citation that can follow. Yep, Rebecca? Rebecca Holcomb, resident of Norwich, <laughs> <laughs> and also the local state rep. That Norwich one may have been an error. I think we may be below that now. It is, I think, Neil, you had the correct number. I think it's closer to 46. That for this is over. And I think what you're talking about is the difference between horizontal equity across districts and vertical equity within districts. And the challenge here is that any additional tax burden board here, even though people are income sensitized, they're not, they're not unaffected. So I guess all, yes. Sorry, just a, a, before we kind of get in this discussion about this, a quick, if you could just have a quick clarifying question about what you wanted to see Leopold about regarding the compact, you just sort Again, of. Yeah, this, this wasn't really part of the agenda, but I, I just want to let people know that I also sent, just so everyone's aware, I sent this to Jay because we had talked about right. this. So there is section H of the contract that specifically says that no state shall pass any legislation that negatively affects the, the stakeholders okay. of the other state or the residents. It's a little unclear, but I will say, and again, giving my card to come to the Dresden meeting tonight, two things. I mean, one is, is looking at our budget, we are going to negatively impact the Dresden budget for the foreseeable future. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know how we can approve middle school sports. I don't know how, we, I don't think we can approve any sort of building over here. It might be out of our control, but like, Again, maybe I'm just being negative, but like we really can't. And then even the last meeting, right, where we were approving the pay down of the debt, we basically convinced our Dresden board members to hold off on that so that we could do more on the facility side of Norwich and look where we are. Right. Like, we didn't pay that debt down ahead of time, which was the correct thing to do for the district, I think. I think, personally, it was the correct thing to do was to pay that down early because we had the, everyone had the means to do it. Dresden was trying to do it. So that's just an example where Norwich, I think, actually negatively now impacted the school district because of this legislation. But, Michael? Um, <clears throat> so a couple thoughts. Um, in reading the letter uh, from the Chair of Ways and Needs and Senate Finance, I don't 
just speaking for myself, I don't believe my role as a school board member in Norwich is to protect state legislators from the predictable consequences of Act 127. I'm also not here to willfully diminish the excellence of our own school district or the combined school district. If the state wants to pull our district apart, it should do it. And so we should approve an entirely reasonable budget, which we have, including maintenance that has to be done. And if they want to bring us in front of a reimagined tax rate review committee, let's do it. Uh, I'm not generally a hothead. I am not generally here to punch people. I realize when you're saying that, you're kind of being a little bit of a hothead, right? You're but I just, calmly. I, I <laughs> simply can't look at our budget and say that this is an unreasonable approach. I can't look at the budgets that I've seen as a spectator the last few years, um, as someone who's kept an eye on the school board, and think that we are being profligate spenders and trying to take advantage of the system. We are simply playing within the rules that General Assembly gave us. I also am not convinced though Representative Holcomb and others would have to try to convince me otherwise, that if we dial down our spending, the five-year cap would persist. I, I just like, oh, well, Norwich is going to reduce its spending. Okay, the five-year cap stays here. I, you know what I mean? I, I just don't, that but-for reasoning, I'm, I'm not there yet. And so I just think our obligation is to make the best decisions we can make. And if there are consequences to that, will navigate those two. But I'd rather stand in front of our neighbors and say, hey, this is what we did, and now the state's doing what it's going to do, and deal with the fallout of that, than start to pull apart the school district in service of trying to mitigate the consequences of Act 127. Just want to make sure that, um, based upon what Michael just said, and I, I'm actually 100% behind you based upon what I'm getting ready to say. From my reading of the letter, and I just want to clarify, I'm kind of looking at Neil and Rebecca in particular, it feels as if the consequence of us keeping the budget that we passed is that we might be put in front of this, I forget how they phrased it, but this trial, this committee, this tribunal. Um, I use Hunger Games, no, just kidding. Um, using Hunger Games imagery. This tribunal to justify our budget is that the only con I mean that's the only consequence that I read in that letter is that am I yeah let me just and just so Rebecca's crystal clear on this too so the budget what we're talking about so everyone's on the same page here the budget that we voted on last meeting we'll call it our base budget that had all of the expenditures in there for the Marion Cross and Dresden, but for Marion Cross, it was the 3.7 million, it was a 3.9% increase. Really had no budget at all in there other than the ongoing like 100,000, and Jamie can correct me if I'm wrong, for some maintenance and facilities and stuff around the buildings. It had nothing in there extra for any sort of facilities planning. Now, this is the issue is, is that we have been taught, and again, the letter, the reason I'm bringing this up, Lisa, is because the letter keeps saying, this is not the time for deferred maintenance. All of the things that we were, are going to spend, we have option, we had, Jamie has us with four different options, one, two, three, four, five, going from a million and a half, all the way up to 10 million if you want to do heat pumps. All of these projects, we were basically waiting on so that when Dresden debt rolled off, we could start doing some of these projects, right? Um, we wanted to get the playground in, which was a small, it wasn't a huge thing. We've got the septic, and now, of course, these are projects that are really addressing some fairly serious things, but they're not, we don't have to do them right away, but I mean, other than Jamie has to get that oil tank out of the ground. Um, but the idea was is let's start moving down with some you know, very, trying to make some very serious efforts to cut our emissions from the school. I think we talked about trying to go all the way to heat pumps and that's just not reasonable, but even what we're doing, the LED lights, the new roof, 
uh, all the new boiler systems, getting rid of the old steam boiler, the winter, the weatherization. I mean, there was a, a total of 2.5 million. We would have been, I think, if we if if it wasn't for Act 127, we would be, I think, going down the path. I'm almost positive of passing a warrant article to go after option three, which was 2.5. I'm pretty sure we would all be going maybe with or without the civil article, right? But, but again, that's a rounding error, a couple hundred grand. But that's what we're really deciding on tonight is it's the 1.425 that we had stacked in there. What, if we take that out, I think that's what the state wants us to do. Just, just take that out, the rest of the budget Again, I, I, it's unclear to me if they want us to somehow take the budget down further so that's because even with the cap, right, the fact that our taxes are going to have 17%, by definition, because it's a 5% increase, we are, the state's still having to pay for some of our, right, we are still not paying our total tax base, and again, the income sensitivity, unfortunately, you can't do these calculations because I have no idea how much tax we actually generate because of income sensitivity, but I believe, so I think this whole conversation is around the 1.425 facilities upgrades, and the whole idea behind that was, at least for me, it made me feel a little bit better about being able to sell a 36 to 40% tax increase to our town because these things are gonna have to do, and I don't know, if we don't get these done now, no. We, we won't. won't. We won't I mean, ever do this. So anyways, everyone's got their hand. I'll stop speaking because at this point I think you guys all know my opinions here and I've tried to present the facts. Um, gonna I'm going to go ahead and say I think you're selling beyond the close at this point. I wholeheartedly <laughs> agree with what Michael has said and Lisa has said, so I don't know what else you want to discuss. And if you want to discuss strategy, that's fine, but well, I, I, think, I think that we as a board, or at least the so I think that so the thing that I think, you know, Neil or or Rebecca can also say this is I think I originally had the exact same reaction. Neil can say this to you. I mean, when I talked to Neil about this over the weekend, I had that I had that was my initial reaction too. The flip side is is that it seems like the state is very serious about trying to get all the towns to pull back on this to. Basically, I think we would approve a much smaller thing, put it into a 10 or 20 year bond, and obviously not get very much benefit from the system, but create goodwill with the state. Uh, you know, question is, is there, if, if everyone doesn't do this, and we're the only ones that do this, then we've really screwed ourselves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't agree. It's Hunger Games. Um, mm -hmm. Neil, you've been. Yeah, so it's, I, th I think to start with, right, so we can't, um, I can't, can't underemphasize um, the challenging position that we all are in at this moment in time trying to, to make a decision on this. Um, to just emphasize something that Garrett just pointed out, right, I don't think the discussion here tonight is changing the base budget. Right. Mm -hmm. The base budget was going to trip that 5% cap regardless, and it had to do with the change in the equalized pupils, which we all knew was coming, right? And, um, if we did one thing right, it was our, our forecasts were fairly spot on, about a 20% increase. Um, what we can, though, consider tonight was the additional 1.425 that we added to things. And um, while I am, uh, I do not disagree in the least with what Michael said, I have a little bit of a different perspective on things. Um, and that is, is that uh, if I'm looking at what's going on right now at the legislative level, um, I am fairly certain that something about this law is going to change. Right, and it's that uncertainty that bothers me. Right, and it's it's knowing that um, I this body, the five of us right here, right yes. now, are responsible or about to be responsible for the single largest uh, tax obligation in our community. Right, and I want to make sure that we're being thoughtful about that when we make the decision on what to do with our spending. 
We keep the 1.4, so this goes to the sort of the four options that were listed in the attachment mm -hmm. that we added into the agenda. Sorry, it's right. you, if, if you haven't read that, I don't know if you want to read it. The lat I mean, it's in person in board docs. We've all yeah, we all read it, yeah. It's a great summary of the yep. options. You know, worked on yep. that a lot, so. Yeah, and so, um, you know, I'm, I, I want to be very careful, right, because, uh, I do believe that there's a certain aspect of how we decide to handle things tonight will be viewed by those that can actually change the levers in this law to make future us uh, either happier or unhappier, right, in, in either direction. Um, I also want to acknowledge that just the, the nature of our system means that we, collective we, all school boards in the state, we're all in this together. Mm -hmm. What we do here locally impacts what our neighbors in Thetford, Hartford, you know, you name it, all the way up into Chittenden County and beyond, what, what they see as well too, right? Which is part of the reason why if you were paying attention, they had already revised that yield number down from when it was originally forecast in the tax letter. And that was based on the increased spending that they were sort of getting a whiff that school districts were um, entertaining. Um, I will also acknowledge, though, on the same time, that uh, as I ran the numbers for a Norwich potential future, um, things are looking pretty grim. And if we didn't address some of those facilities needs now, yep. our ability to address them in the future um, goes away, potentially. Um, at a high level, I will tell you that my estimates, um, rather conservative in nature, um, show that property taxes will increase by about 109% over the next five years. So you can consider that the amount of tax that you pay on your property is going to just a little bit more than double in the next five years based on my current estimates. That's simply not sustainable for the town of Norwich. We could essentially just get a pencil out and erase the town from the state of Vermont um, because I'm not sure that it would continue to be able to exist in the function that it's existing in right now. But I think one of the potential benefits of Norwich being um, neighborly and maybe deferring the, the additional spending is providing us then with the opportunity to engage in a discussion with our colleagues in the legislature that the implementation of this act has, uh, we're, we're seeing is, is failing us. And I, I think it's failing not just Norwich, but it's also failing those other districts that were scheduled to see some tax capacity increases through all of this. It's just not working out the way that it is intended to, and it needs to be changed. Um, and so I, I might be leaning towards not including the additional spending in the hopes that we've generated ourselves a platform for continued discussion on how do we make this better for Norwich. Because if we do nothing, if nothing in the law changes, yeah, you're looking at a tax rate going from just over $2 to just over $4 in five years. And I, I believe that that's simply not sustainable. I believe it's a flaw in 127 that really needs to get addressed. Um, and we are the town to make that case, right? Th there are some other towns in the state that are feeling similar pain, but not to the extent that we are. And while we may have a perception of being a perception of being a wealthy town, not everybody in this town is wealthy. Um, I've got neighbors on either side of me um, for whom this would be a big effing deal. And I want to make sure that our voice is heard in Montpelier as we try to work through a solution to this thing. Because right now, I think it's busted. And, and that's my biggest, I mean, unfortunately, the numbers here are just, I mean, I don't know what, the 100% now, you've got me even, I mean, even the 40%, I mean, we're talking, you know, on a ten thousand, yeah, five half million dollar house, a ten thousand dollar tax bill is suddenly going to turn into fourteen or fifteen thousand. And if yeah. and it's going if it's going to double, we're talking at five hundred thousand dollar house right now is going to have in a couple of years a twenty thousand dollar tax bill, right, for a half million dollar house. 
And we also have to get over, I mean, I did the numbers too, just so you guys are aware too, like the tax rates today at the 67.5% cap, after the reassessment, it's going to be the same. Because in the way you, people have to think about this, I'm going off a little bit of a tangent here, but think about what your house should be worth if you were to list it today. Multiply it by 0.675, and I'll bet you that is your assessed value. I did the math, and it's about, it's pretty much about close. And again, then what you're looking at here, which is even more worrisome, unfortunately, is, is that, you know, whether you're looking at 2.31, 2.71, I mean, Neil, if you're talking four bucks, you're going to move the decimal point over one, right, to make it equivalent to, to Hanover. Hanover is at $17.5. So if we're going to be at, after this is all done here, close to close to $30, right, like 10 minutes away. Right, which is, sorry, and I just, I'll, I'll stop, but which is why I, we, we need to generate the environment and the opportunity to have a seat at the table for fixing this. <clears throat> Go ahead, sorry. No problem at all. Um, okay, so to clarify, my original question is the, so, okay, we're not going to touch the 3.9% the budget, so we're only talking about the facilities. additional facilities. Okay. So my original question was, this letter implies that if we were to go ahead and do what we had voted, you know, what we were planning to do for the facilities, we would be called in front of this committee to discuss why we did it. But it also sounds as if we might be held up as an example of how people manipulate the system and how things go awry, which would not be good for Norwich or Vermont or anyone. Like it just, that, that feels like a bad path to go down. So there's that, that's a second consequence in addition to just being called in front of this committee. But my concern is from, at least what I heard at our last meeting from Jamie and um, Tony is that there are some facility things that need to be taken care of now. And that if we wait three to four years, it will be more expensive to fix a roof if it's broken than it will be to fix it before it's broken. It will, you know, the, the oil tank has to come up. If the oil tank's coming up, we've got some sunk costs in getting that oil tank up that maybe we could do some other things. If we replace all the LED, all the lights with LED, we will actually save some money. So it feels as if there are some things, facilities-wise, that I too, I would, I am trained to be cooperative and collaborative rather than the other way around, and I prefer that. And I would prefer to place us in a position where we have a seat at the table and we can help fix this, and this can all happen. I want, that is a goal of mine. And I also don't want for the school to have a problem that we can't fix because we don't have money, because we didn't spend money in advance. And so that's my concern, is I just, I heard, I heard a plea from the facilities people to do at least something um, you know, we all agree that it would be great to do, you know, the most environmentally conscious thing and, you know, go geothermal and save money in the long run, but we can't do that. So we were backing things off. But I, I, I guess I hesitate to back us off to zero from, like, like if option five was the Cadillac and we settled for option three, which is the Honda, I don't want necessarily want us to, you know, to back us to the Chevy Nova, which never really worked. Um, because, yeah. So that's my concern. So I guess I just want to make sure that that's part of the discussion as well, Correct. is so, <clears throat> if we back it off, what do we back it off to? Do we back it off to zero, or do we just say, because we could justify it in front of this commission, look, we were going to spend 1.4, you know, we thought about spending 2.6 or whatever it was, we backed it off to 1.4, based upon what you all were seeing for the state, we, wanted to, we want to cooperate and we want the state to be in a good place. So we backed off our facility spending to, I'm just gonna throw out a number, 600,000. I have no idea what it would be. But we couldn't go to zero. And I, I just am wondering if that could be part of this conversation yeah, so me, too. Get, let me just address your thing, Lisa. And I, and I know, actually, Jamie, I'm sorry you have your hand, you, I don't know if you've had your hand up for hours, but you're probably <laughs> chopping at the pit here. 
Part of the thing here is I think of course does board docs not have Jamie's analysis on it? Do you guys see her? So to answer your question, yeah. I think the real so, discussion. So I'm just gonna talk. Okay. <laughs> so hi. hi. So Garrett, to your question, I just barely posted it because I was holding off today. Okay, because okay. because there was so many pieces in motion. Okay. okay. But what Garrett was asking and what you're saying, Lisa. And my plea to the board is this. We already ran forward and filed documents with a septic plan with taking that oil tank out and not putting it back in the ground. So I redid a number, a scenario two light, if you will, and I have posted it if you want to refresh. I posted it because I didn't want to do anything wrong. I posted it in the administrative section. Um, and my suggestion, which I hope you, I'm listening to everybody and I totally get the, oh my God, part of it. Um, and I totally get that we need to set an example. Um, I'm hoping that we could look at this scenario to light that will at least get us in our HVAC to where we need to be. And if we did it as a, as a lease for 10 years at 2%, it would make our payment, it would fit into it. We're gonna be over five. There's nothing we can do about that, okay? And those are those are because they keep playing with numbers. I'm sorry, every time they lower the yield, it's going to make more people hit the 5% cap. It's, it's a screwed up system. But anyway, it would make a payment like below 100,000 with the offsetting sa savings and we could at least get our boiler plants to where we need them to be. Yeah, so um, I'm still not seeing on board docs, but with Jamie, with Jamie, I believe. I see it, yeah, it is there. It's now. there. Yeah. It's, it's in administrative okay. content. But Jamie put this here, and again, we're, uh, we were calling it, and Jamie, I had sent her an email this afternoon, and we called it. Basically, this is option two light. So this is basically option two minus the LED lights. What it really, and Jamie, I don't know if you have my email, but I think adding the LED lights almost because of the savings, the projected savings, I think it changes the, I think it changes the overall cost by like $500 for the year. Um, Anyways, that might be a discussion for a minute from now. I think what option two light does is it takes, it's not addressing the roof, there's no solar, there's no code updates. It is just, the, it's removing the tank, the oil tank, it's installing the LP tank, and then it's basically doing all the boiler work, which is gonna you know, be a fairly substantial carbon savings. Because um, I think to Jamie's point, going with option one, which was basically converting our existing boros from oil right. to LP and still dealing with the steam. I mean, this is the type of thing where I think Act 127 aside, we would be going down the road, I think, of option three, which, which was also replacing the roof. Because, by the way, that is the only thing that came back is the most pressing need in our facilities up, uh, study that was done now twice. By, right. So Jamie, I don't know, and again, so, and I'm kind of, maybe I, so maybe we keep the question there before we start talking about which option, how we finance it, whether we do 10 years, 20, but I think the question immediately on the table is, is do we just go guns a-blazing and keep the 1.425 number in there, figuring that, you know what, like now is the time, and if we don't do it now, it's going to be never, or do we move down this road, which I think is... I think we, no matter what, the Vermont can't come back at us and, and say, hey guys, like you're now, you're still baking your budget when at the end of the day, these things are in here, we're never answering them correctly. They're only adding a hundred and, what's Jamie's number here? A hundred and some odd thousand to the annual budget. So I think the question to answer, sorry, long-winded way of saying Lisa, we're not, we're not just walking away okay. from this. It's just that we would be financing it over many years we're not obviously taking advantage of the system, which right. is what Neil's concern is. And now, sorry, Mark. And, and I apologize for asking, not seeing this, but I was traveling all day, so I 
I didn't so, see anything. Uh, it was just loaded. This, <laughs> we were literally, Jamie was um, unfortunately trying to do this this afternoon because, again, Jamie's right. been working overtime, and I'm, this is why these things also just make me so, I just go red with the state because it impacts all of us because we're, we're sitting here tonight. Jamie's rewriting this again. I mean, so I guess I guess the question my is, the two consequences are, one, you could be hauled in front of a tax rate review committee, and two, Neil is saying there could be a consequence of, fit, well, three really. The mm -hmm. second consequence is they could change the law. And in, in between those two, Neil is saying you could undercut the negotiating position of affected towns because of the spending, right? Come to the negotiation and say, look, we did everything we could. Right. And I guess the question I have for Representative Holcomb is, what is your sense of it? Well, what is your sense of uh, the negotiation that may happen to adjust Act 20, 127 in Norwich's favor? Is, like, is there any sort of possibility that if we do not pass facility spending, that that will lead to some sort of favorable adjustment of 127, or at least the avoidance of consequences of taking away the 5% cap in 127. What's your read of the situation? So I, I need to be very clear. I don't speak for the legislature, mm -hmm. and I'm one of many, many people, so, so I can Ask for a read, not a <laughs> I just want to be really clear on that. Yeah. Um, um, and, and I think I need to first apologize, um, because I think there is something wrong in what's happening, but I also feel that there's a perfect storm. So we're focusing a lot today on 127. There are several other things that are coming to a head right now that are also driving up tax rates that are not 127. And so I, I need to acknowledge the intent was to make it possible for other communities to provide facilities comparable to what we do. There are several other, I, I would say, failures of state level leadership that are driving everything to a head at the same time. And I think, Neil, you've mentioned some of them. Um, but it's the PCB mitigation. It's years of unfunded liabilities related to infrastructure. It's health care costs that have been increasing in double digits year after year. We could go on, and you all know them. Um, so I, I, I also think a second problem is the inability to plan more than a year at a time. And that is a cost in and of itself. And when I look at the specific investments that you are trying to make, those are the kinds of investments that yield long-term sustainability. So I think you have to be clear about the fact that you, that, that additional item is designed to reduce your tax impact over the long haul. And I think we've made mistakes in that, you know, I know if, I, I don't know quite why they picked this transition language, because this was the language in Act 46 that similarly led to a spike. Um, and, and these kinds of short-term mechanisms often don't work for, for the exact reasons that many people have described here. So I, I think you're kind of in an impossible position. You've talked about the yield. Uh, the reality is you have given your best guess on what people will be paying on their tax bills. Uh, you're, they're going to vote on your best guess, and no one will know what the actual bill is until the legislature closes the session out. Because that yield and that tax rate at the state level, the average, is going to bounce from here until the end of the semester. So I, I just want to acknowledge the volatility you are trying to make good decisions and hold a steady course in the most unpredictable and volatile type, type thing I've ever seen in my entire career in public education. So I want to acknowledge that right out of the gate. Um, I, think, I think that it will help this community that yours was one of the first communities to acknowledge the responsibility to treat all children as Vermont children and not just the children in our own town. And so the fact that you did that early and loud, mm -hmm. and that you've continued to say that, I think has to count for something. I don't hear anyone saying that children who live in other places should suffer, and we shouldn't. I think that the fact that what you're talking about is spending that is designed to um, reduce long-term costs is a good thing. Um, I think this formula is going to change. I don't think this formula is going to survive in its current form. And I did do some poking around today. And when the people who authored the report behind Act 126 submitted their proposals to the legislature, the legislature picked up the weights and stuck them into the existing formula. The recommendation was actually to shift the state from the kind of formula that we currently have to a foundation-based plan. 
And you cannot, you cannot turbocharge an existing formula that's already struggling and not expect some un unintended consequences. And I think part of the challenge we have right now is that not only can no one explain what's happening and why, and it really doesn't matter what community you go to, I'm seeing people in the Northeast Kingdom who should have been strong beneficiaries who are not benefiting from this change, and they can't even tell their communities why. So that's one piece of it. But the other thing is the outcome of the decisions you make does no, no longer seems to be connected to the decision you make. And when you have that degree of, I don't know what the word is, no, you probably have one. Disconnect. Um, disconnect. <laughs> I, I think it, it, the, the system begins to lose its credibility and it begins to behave in unpredictable ways. And I think that's where we are. So I think what you have to stay on is your responsibility to be as fiscally responsible as possible while providing for the needs of your community. Acknowledge the needs given the extraordinary year we're in, where we truly have an extraordinary bump in education spending. The other big thing is the dry, dry up of uh, ESSER dollars and ARPA dollars. And despite being told, do not, do not spend ESSER and ARPA on you know, continual costs, a lot of people did. And they're now trying to make those one-time expenditures, full-time expenditures, and that's a lot of the increase right now, I think, as well. Um, you, while this transition shook us out, I think you've got to try to hold, to the extent you can, the steadiest ways you can, well, also where you can, thinking about the small ways to, to, to soften the hit on the state as a whole. I think you need to engage. There is a hearing on Thursday. I've tried to connect um, uh, both the chair and Neil to, um, to the, the committee so that they can testify. And I think we need to be continuing to have this conversation. Um, so I wish I could say, um, I will tell you that we didn't even know the letter was going out until after it went out. Um, I can tell you that even though the review committee for the 5% hits, was, there's been no guidance from the agency of ed over the original review committee, so we don't even know what that was supposed to be. And there has been absolutely no discussion, and we can't get any information on the new tax rate jail that's coming out. So I don't know. I don't know that anyone has a plan for that. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if they have capacity in the state to review all the right. budgets that they get right. that state. Mm -hmm. So I think yeah, there are a lot of unintended consequences here. The other thing no one's talked about is if people do make the cuts that some people are ta talking about, we're a tiny district, really. You know, if you're looking at South Burlington, they're looking at not man to other people. How many teachers do we cut before we also get the pension a plan in trouble as well? Right. So I think there's a lot of things coming out at yeah. the same time yeah. that um, are going to make it important um, for the state to, to revisit this funding formula and make sure it's adequately accounted for those employees. So I, I wish I could offer you better Got news. It. I don't have it. So, and I, I appreciate you. Yeah chatting with us putting you on putting yeah. you on the spot. <laughs> yeah, no, it's fine. I do so. think we're gonna have to look at a different education plan. Okay. I mean I think that so again I I have I should be doing my work here in the past two days and I've been only doing this and I think that <laughs> after running these spreadsheets and trying to figure out how do we cut how do we even cut this, I can only conclude that the education formula is flawed because if if in order to cut it back so that we're only we're even getting down to a 20% increase from this, and then we have to increase class sizes to 45. Like, I sent a note to Jamie today, I'm like, are we sure that we're actually, because I've seen some towns that have done an audit of their students to actually get more students that, you know, they've actually somehow gone through, and I, that email I sent you guys today, somehow these towns are, I guess, looking at their student body and actually figuring out maybe we have more poverty or more English in the second but, but I think it's important. I think the other thing is, and to, to that end, what we're buying when we do that, a lot of it is social services. And I think mm -hmm. a core flaw in this formula is the incentive it creates to cost shift from state social services into the education right. class. And I am all in on supporting children who need a fair chance. I've got some of them in my own background. If people hadn't helped my family out, I would not be here today. However, the state has a failing mental health system that is systematically underfunded, and those costs are falling back into the education fund, which is the pair of first resort. We cannot have school districts alone solve all the problems of poverty. And to have school districts pick up all those costs isn't even an efficient way to treat poverty. 
So I think there's a bigger conversation here about the porosity between the education fund and the state budget and how, you know, is this actually the right way to, to crack this nut? So I think we have to have that too. Uh, there's been a lot of caution to, into education from other arenas. So do you have this nine? Um, I didn't really, when I signed up to be chair, I didn't really sign up to try to run meetings like this, frankly, because, I mean, it, 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 it's just so complex. I think, Lisa, you have one? I had a question for Rebecca okay, and kind of Neil, based Sorry. upon what, what she just said, yep, hopefully forward. pretty fast. So one of the most disturbing things I've just heard <laughs> is what Rebecca just said, which is that there are districts in the Northeast Kingdom who are supposed to be benefiting from this who are not. I mean, when we voted, what was it, three years ago, Neil, to support, I mean, we as a board took a vote to support the state of Vermont moving towards helping all kids have a good education in the state of Vermont. I mean, we, we all voted for that. We supported it, even though we knew that Norwich would take a quote-unquote hit of some sort monetarily and tax-wise, but we did that because I think everybody at the table then believed that that was the right thing to do. And, I, and again, I think we still do. I am disturbed that if we're hurting as one of the wealthier towns and the towns that are supposed to be benefiting are also hurting, this feels like it is failing on every level. I mean, I, I, I guess I'd be more inclined to take a, you know, to, to absorb pain if I thought that it was actually benefiting people who are, who we hope would benefit from it. So that said, is there a way, and this is kind of a Neil and Rebecca question, I think, with you as in your role as a school board association person, um, can we start to work together, the town, I mean, like, not just the wealthier towns being upset, but, like, all the districts being upset and and just saying this is this is failing completely. It doesn't help us with this decision right now, but it does help us get to kind of Neil's point of getting a seat at the table and fixing this in a way that it's fixed. And I, I would wholeheartedly echo what Rebecca just said is that school districts are being asked to do jobs that they were not designed to do and could be designed to do, but it would take a heck of a lot more money and expertise than teachers currently have to be able to do that. So I think we need to be careful about all of this. Um, again, it doesn't get us to what we should do tonight, but I just, I, I want to honor both what Rebecca and, and Neil said about let's figure out how to fix this too. So I think tonight, so I think the, the question right now, just to kind of keep us on track here, I think is let's talk about, I guess, you know, I think, do we want to go full on and keep the 1.425 in and just say, you know what, we don't trust the system, we don't trust the legislatures, we're not going to have a seat at the table, even if we're good actors here, or do we want to, I think that, I think option B is, is to, you know, do the financing, do, you know, either Jamie's route, maybe we end up, we can talk about, I think this would be the next discussion on the table here in a few minutes, is whether we do option B light, whether we add the LEDs in, and then whether we do a 10-year versus a 20-year. I think those are the two. Those are really the two decisions on the table tonight, unless anyone has a third option. But in my mind, at least, it's either, again, just act in our sole best interest. I have to. Agree. I mean, we have been jumping up and down now. With I mean, I know Neil's been on a bunch of calls. I've been on calls. Unfortunately, when I have been talking about the fact that how can even Norwich afford a 30 to 40 percent tax rate increase, I I seem to. The response from most of the folks that I'm on the call and some of our previous or an existing representatives just kind of look at you and you know what you guys have tons of money it's, I don't you know sorry this is the way it worked out but I'm sure you'll figure out a way I mean it's I have not gotten a lot of warm and fuzzies from the state folks because we unfortunately are we are so far off the roadmap as far as how high our taxes are compared to everyone else, I'm not sure if anyone else cares, to your point, Michael. I, I, I really don't know if they care. But I am coming around to the fact that, listen, if we are, if we are gonna be here for the next 200 years as a town in, in Vermont, and now is probably the time to at least make a, a goodwill effort, and I think this is a, 
This is a pretty huge goodwill effort because the budgets that we have passed have all been you know, very reasonable. We, right now we have a budget without any of these facilities upgrades of our per pupil spending is going up by $2. I mean, this is a flat to down budget really in all reality. So I think the question is, is do we go for this, to, to just pass all the big money or do we go and put it into a finance properly business as usual, it, frankly, we're adding $100,000 instead of 1.425 to our, technically, what the state would be picking up on our behalf. Neil? Yeah. yeah, so to that point, Gareth, and I just want to make sure that I'm walking through Jamie's numbers and I understand what, what we're considering here. So in this scenario to light Jamie, um, I interpret this as this would add uh, for next year's budget, we would add just over 89000 to... Correct. That would be ad admin fees, and it's shown here in the revenue and assessment. So that would be the, the admin fees, and a portion of that may be contingency that if we didn't need would go back. And then the next year out, that dollar amount would be replaced by... I would suggest the 2% 10-year because it would be the same dollar amount of a payment due to the savings. So you think, so then the, you're saying that the out years would be approximately $90,000 payments? Yeah, 80, I think it's 87. Hold on, let me grab it. Jamie, why, I think it's 85, 444. So why, why are you saying the 10 year and the 20 year, the payments are the same? Cause they look like they're about half. No, no. Hold on. Let me, one second. Let me pull it up so we can look at it together. So, so here, oops, let me make it bigger. So the payment here after the $31,000 savings that comes off of the changes, right? The payment for 10 years at 2% will be 85,440. And then the, the payment for 20 years, and we're just using 4%. I know the rates are coming down a little bit right now, but if just using 4%, because we use them on the rest of them, 20 years, the payment would be 45,670. That's after the annual savings. Okay, so you are, so you obviously, I mean, this is just simple math, but you are saving a fairly substantial amount if we go 20 in the four versus the 10 and the two. Is there, advan is there an advantage to do the lease, Jamie, as far as like it does, they do protect your savings, don't they? Isn't that what I'm understanding? They guarantee the savings? Well, yes, well, they would do it on either one, but the 10, they usually will guarantee savings for 10 years. Um, it In Vermont, you're allowed to do the 10 year lease um, because it's a uh, it's an energy savings project that has guaranteed savings. But this also this qualifies for the HUD um, is it HUD the, the special grant monies that are available right now at two percent. And you can pay it early. You don't have to uh, you can pay it off early. You know if by some amazing means you have you know, a surplus for whatever reason, you know, um, you can you can redirect the money and pay it early. Okay. So so just to keep us on track then with what's on here to your question, Neil, so that the things that are off is we drop the LED lighting. That's why we're calling it option two light. Other than that, it's our previous option two. Right? So Right. Was... And and as they go through this and you know firm up the numbers if the LED lighting fit, even if a portion of it fit, if some of these numbers by chance come in lower than what's been projected here, then we could try to, you know, we could still try to address some of the lighting. But Jim, and the lighting too. So I was I was looking at option two in my spreadsheet versus I, I added in your option two light. And with the LED lighting because of the because of the fairly significant savings. It barely increases the annual cost. My on two, yeah. So the annual costs 
on two would be 95,702 at 10 years. So versus 85. So we'd be adding 10 grand a year for all the LED lighting. Okay. I mean, and then obviously the big thing that we're walking away from at this point is our option three, which really included the big nut, the big items there was, it was the roof. It was a solar array, which again, I think we were all kind of, you know, depending on how that worked out and the code updates, but that was another six, seven, eight. I mean, that was another million dollars, right? Which if we go with option two light, we are definitely walking away with that. I guess I personally, if we're going to go with option two, it's only a, I just feel like, you know, adding the LED lighting for the amount of, and I don't want to just be spending wildly here, but the fact that it's only 10 grand a year, and I believe that, I believe that the fossil fuel, I mean, um, sorry, the, uh, the savings are fairly, are like really substantial. I think there's a lot of bang for your buck as far as our fossil fuel. Right. Reduction. Right. I, yeah, I, I think it's, so you're saying the LEDs are good. Yeah, I, I I just really want to be on record. Like, if you look at what you have this what this board has done over the course of the last two or three years, is extremely responsible budgeting. You've deliberated and, and almost every session have acknowledged that the intent of the law to bring greater equity to school funding in the state of Vermont was admirable, and that we were definitely going to be on the wrong end of that in terms of the overall effect of our on our finances. But not like this. And that the fact that we're deciding whether or not to, to upgrade our lighting to LED to be more energy efficient and reduce our carbon footprint, and we're talking about punting that so that we can avoid having to answer to some some committee that's going to decide whether or not our, our increases are justified. So I just want to be clear here. I, um, I understand the anger, right? It's not just that we get reviewed by a committee. It's that the committee then would have the, the pass on the recommendation in the A, we would have the authority to remove our cap. So there's, there's, there's potential pain associated with this. And it's not, it would it'd be one thing if I just said somebody's going to come in and review my budget and be like, shame, 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 you did a bad thing. Um, but I don't, uh, I mean, I want to be, be careful here, right? Because mm -hmm. removing the cap um, really, puts a lot of pain on Norwich taxpayers. I think by do, by doing this and financing it for 10 years at 2%, adding that to your point, Jay, I don't I don't think that's going to run us amok of, of this legislature. Like, there's no way right. that they can, you know, I, 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 I think the only way that we run amok of the legislature is if we go balls to the wall and do the 1.425 million. Sorry for my language, but <laughs> that I, I think is where it's going to be, you know. And again, I, right, I don't know, right? Like 2020 hindsight, we might be looking at this and be like, you were the greater fool for not going for that because we're still at a 40% tax rate increase and they didn't do a thing, but at least go ahead, Jeff. I was just going to say, say that, so, so it, it still is a gamble. Right? We're, we're still assuming that if we, if, we, if we play nice, that we will have some kind of say or that they won't remove the cap. And I really, given what's happened so far, I have very little faith that, that even that will happen. So, so it's it, so to me it feels like a it feels like there's a risk either way. It's like we either we risk the ability to do improvements that are not frivolous, um, that that really are, are important for the school, and that probably you're right won't be able to be funded later. Um, and it, I don't know. It just it, it just feels to me that we're 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 stepping out. We're considering curtailing our plans on the on the hope. That I feel has very little evidence that, that it will have an impact that, that'll lead folks to somehow change the law favorably for us. Yeah. Sorry, um, I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet. No, I have shared your trust me. Ever since Friday evening when this came in, <laughs> I have woken up every morning way earlier than I should have, thinking about this and getting angry and stressed and. So I, yeah. I know it's getting late. I have two very quick comments and a question from Neil. Um, my first comment is there's a very small chance that at some point in time some member of the legislature or the agency or this tax rate 
um, group could watch this meeting to think about our budget preparations. And I would just say, you know, and when faced with uncertainty, like simply you go back to first principles, and that's trying to do the right thing for our school district and kids. And so wherever we end up, like the discussion has always been about what's the right investment for our students, um, not like, hey, you know, this is how do we maximize the benefit of the kids? Right, because right? we talked about the cap in the context of can we make investments up front that will lower the overall liability over time and align with what our students need in the environmental stewardship that's in some of our strategic plan. Yep. Um, two, uh, to the extent I'm a little frustrated, is that my two major domains are education and healthcare. Uh, Vermont's healthcare system is extraordinarily challenged. And I have a great deal of respect for Vermont's policymakers. I used to work for the Joint Fiscal Office, Tax Department, the Agency of Human Services, the Governor's Office, like a bad penny, goes from agency <laughs> to agency. Um, and I'm increasingly worried that the public policy discussion is about Vermont as policymakers wish it to be, not Vermont as it is, and with potentially dire consequences for healthcare institutions and educational school districts. I guess my question for Neil is, um, I cannot think of a single Vermonter that I know who is more um, well-versed and thoughtful about education issues, and you are the past president, I still believe, of the VSBA. And so could you give us just briefly like some sense of where that group of thoughtful Vermonters is about <laughs> where we are in this, particularly in the eye of this hurricane, and where we might be going, and to the extent that might help us make a final decision about our budget this evening. Mm. Just value uh, your input. Yeah, mm -hmm. so we had a meeting uh, last night to talk, talk about this. Um, uh, board of Directors, 20 some odd folks um, offering their uh, personal opinions and experiences in their school district. Um, uh, everybody universally along with New York, uh, along with Norwich, um, supports the intent of 127, right? I mean, there were kids in, in, in parts of the state that just weren't getting the services that they needed and things weren't working. It needed to change. Um, but uh, there's a lot of folks that are in the same place that Norwich is of grappling with tax rate increases and they're worried that their budgets aren't going to pass. Um, and so there is no, uh, if you're asking if there is a single point of view on this whole thing, I would say the single point of view is frustration, anger, uh, wanting to do the right thing. Um, working in a system that is so convoluted that you can't, I can't even explain this to my wife, and I tried one night, um, in preparation to be able to do it in front of like a larger group of our public. I'm like, if I can't explain it to my wife, like then, you know, um, and just, I mean, the, this whole thing is challenging. Those are the themes that I heard, not we're going to handle this this way and we're going to handle it that way. I do think that the path forward, at least from the discussion that I've heard tonight, is this compromise approach, where it's not the full 1.425, it's this lesser number. I think in order to help us get to a place tonight of finality, um, I would need to know, um, with Jamie's assistance, some numbers. So if somebody were going to propose a budget number, and then what the language would need to be for a motion then for, because Jamie, I'm assuming there would be an additional warrant article then for some borrowing? No. You don't have to if you go the lease, but if you go the lease, uh, the 2% lease option in Vermont, you don't have to do a separate warrant article. Oh shoot, I just made my finger bleed again. I was trying to fix it. Um, I took a digger the other day. That's why I've been out of the office. This is my face, like off of the concrete where I fell. Um, so anyway, I'm doing fine. But um, so so if you so it's do just the, the revised budget number, then yes, yes, absolutely, Neil. And it would be this one right here. Let me just pull that back up. Can I, mean, I you know, but the the other. I mean, so okay, if we're not, if we're gonna walk away from 0.25, I guess the other. We could just finance this over 10 years. It's going to add the after the you know savings 85 grand a year. That's obviously going to you know 
be above our cap amount, you know, well less than 10%, you know, whatever it is, right, as far as the act. But the question is, do we, do we stack a few fixed costs in there? Do we add a fixed, you know, 600 grand in there? Like, or do we really be good citizens and just finance it over 10 years at 2% and basically yeah. we're only going to be at, now we're adding 85 grand to a, for facilities like because that's all that's in our budget. Like, I think it's also important people are watching this after the fact to understand that our entire budget there is no facility cost right. in our budget. We have no debt right now, right? At the Marion Cross School except for the well, playground. Well, you, you do because the playground and the septic for the playground, the septic, but it's about a hundred thousand of interest payments, right? I think the payments on that it's in the budget. Yep. Yep. I mean, it's a very small amount of debt, as Correct. far as like, what we're carrying for facilities right now. Yeah, I mean, I guess the only thing that I would say to that, like this is all, it's a, it's a crapshoot. Like, what's the what's the better answer here tonight? And I'm not sure that I know. What I will say is that I do think maybe. Uh, Showing a little restraint in what we're doing here gives us um, the opportunity to join with I, what I anticipate to be a whole host of other school districts across the state that are going to say, uh, we followed your request. We cut back on the spending, but damn, you better then show up for us legislature when it comes to construction aid. Yeah. Because that's really one of the key things that we're all experiencing here across the state is we need assistance with facilities updates. And if if you're going to, you know, if, if we took a step forward and met the request on the spending control related to Act 127, then goddamn, I need you to step up and help us with construction aid. Well, I think I agree with that, but with Rebecca Miller, I think if if they don't recast the waiting system, like the fact that our tax are going to have 30, even if with the construction aid and even all this other stuff going, that's the problem with doing all this stuff is we're just going to be paying, this is just going to be stacked on top of the 36 or 40%. It's somewhere between 30 and 40% tax rate increase. Every sink, that, that's a flat budget from last year. So. Again, when we went from 29 to 33 percent, it was because I'm using this year's budget. So we're already sitting like this Act 127 is costing us a tax rate increase of somewhere between 30 and 40 percent before you add any other annual budgets to it, annual increases to cost of teachers and health care and facilities. So unfortunately, like I don't even know, but is the legislature going to actually recast that and actually? help take that 40% increase down because at the end of the day guys like I don't know about you but you can live in a million and a half dollar house in Norwich but you're not who's going to pay $45,000 in taxes to live in Norwich and it, even even if you have tons of money it just makes no sense yeah I know just quickly and uh, we're going to have to make a decision tonight not knowing the answer to those questions right right mm -hmm. so my my request would be, and I've heard everything you say, Garrett, and I don't disagree with it, but my request at this point in time, so we can move forward with the other two projects, because they're all intertwined together, would be for, <clears throat> for this board to embark on the uh, scenario two light with a 2% 10 year lease. We can always look again, we will know more within the next, four months than we know now, right? And knock on wood, you know, we're doing okay in the other areas. And if there is any other grant monies that come available, or if we can save money in some of our other projects, then we might be able to phase in some of the lighting with the amount of money that we've already got budgeted. I mean, with three kids that are all their teenage years, I guess the extra 10 grand a year to approve the LED lighting and the fact that it's going to rain again this weekend and no one can ski, I guess is like, I would like, it would make me feel better as a human to put the LED lighting on top of this for an extra 10 grand a year. I'm with you. But again, I hear you, Jamie, that we can obviously kick the can down the road. I just do think that that's like, I mean, that seems like it's a huge bang for the buck as far as energy savings. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so I think what we're here, yeah, anyways. I don't want to add more to our budget, but a part of me is just like, that does not seem like a huge increase given the savings. And I'm still not there. I, I guess I guess given that the legislature apparently didn't see this whole thing coming, despite years of planning and implementing Act 127, makes me think that smarter brains may not prevail in the next few years either. And we should get well done getting this good and continue with our budget, which has now been justified in a myriad, myriad different ways. I mean, these are necessary improvements. You mean for the 1.4? For the 1.4, yeah. yeah. I don't, I don't see any reason to back down. Although I know that Neil feels that we should continue. Neil, <laughs> just uh, to clarify, I understand where you're coming from. I don't see it as capitulation. I see it as. Um, I don't want to be the person, the group, that rubbed it in the face of the legislature, caused them to remove the 5% cap provision in Norwich, and have our tax rate go up by 40% in one year. I can't, I, I honestly, I can't stomach that for my own community. Like, I can't see my, I, I, I would feel terrible if that happened. So that I, I have one question then. As a follow up to that, and then one comment. Jamie? And I can't see you because I'm not on Zoom <laughs> here. I think if you go like this. Are you out there? <laughs> I love the Dream of Genie reference. Jamie. Oh, yes, I'm sorry, I am. I had my mute on. Yep. Jamie, I, I, you know, I'm very much um, where Lily is, but I, I do know how much you and Tony spend time thinking about our facilities work. Are you okay with the light view or not? The light option, rather. I'm always okay with whatever we can get. Tony probably would say no. <laughs> he would rather have what we were going to do. But I understand the political pressures that you all are under. And I think that the light version will allow us to move forward with the other two projects because they're all hooked together. Um, you know, so, well, I'm okay with either one, but I, I understand where you're at. I understand what's at stake, I guess. And, and in dealing with the legislature and seeing all of the emails going back and forth with everybody, um, I understand why Neil is concerned. Uh, you know, um, a comment that is about legislative strategy. Um, it has been some time since I spent every day all winter in the legislature. I used to get to do that, um, though I still spend some time um, in government relations role in, in healthcare. Uh, I've not been up there this year, but I have to believe that the temperature is very, very hot on this issue. Um, I would be nervous sitting in the chair as a town situated like Nervit, Norwich and like what kind of questions you might get and being forced to defend all manner of stuff that's like outside the purview. Mm -hmm. um, I'll leave it to others, but very thoughtful written testimony might be a way to go because I just think it's going to be a hard, um, I, I don't know. I, other people have probably been watching testimony other than me, but I just would be nervous that Norwich would be posterized or dragged in directions that would be deeply unfair to the work that this board has done. And when you're in there, it's their room. Like, you, like arguing with them is inadvisable. And I say this as someone who's once sent to talk about reducing the earned income tax credit. Boy, that was a fun day at the office. <laughs> Thanks, Peter Shumlin. Right? Like, oh boy. Like, had better mornings. <laughs> so I just, just as people want us yeah. to testify, I think we should be, we should contribute. We should do so carefully um, if we can, right? So that's just a piece of editorial commentary. Do with it what you'd like. You mean testify? The offer written testimony written. as opposed to For being, Thursday. We're being dragged. I mean, there are other people who are more connected to this, like Neil. I would just get nervous about it. Um, I sort of love the extemporaneous back and forth, but you don't you want to be 
turn into a pincushion in the, during the hottest moment right. of this discussion. Right. All right, so where are we at? Decision time? I sent both of the numbers to Neil via chat. I can send them to anybody, but I send them to Neil because he asked me the question. Well, so there's two numbers. I am going to make a motion for the lower number, which does not include the LED lighting. Move to what, approve. Can, can, two can you tell us what the two numbers are? Sorry. Uh, yeah, seven million nine hundred twenty thousand nine hundred and forty-three dollars without the lights. Seven million nine hundred and forty-six thousand eight hundred and thirty-five dollars with the light. So those, both of those, are the light versus yeah. scenario. Right. Yeah, scenario with two lights. With light light without the light. <laughs> light yeah. Light it's with a light version with lights. Light version without lights. Does not include, does does not the, include the roof. Yeah, it's the not the one point four two five yeah. that was previously. Right. Well, don't forget the one point two four two five because the the option three was actually two and a half. Yeah, right. 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 The right. 1.425 was really only going to handle. It was basically yeah. going to handle option two up front, and then it was going to option. Then it was going to do the rest for option three, which we were going to do some anyways. Yeah. Yeah, right. We were just going to cover the first half of it with the 1.425. Right. So Jamie, the the one between the LEDs and the other one is 10 grand. Is that what the difference is? Um, it's no, it's seven million nine forty six eight thirty five. Hold on, seven nine four six eight thirty five minus seven nine two eight nine forty three. Seventeen thousand eight hundred and ninety two. So it's seventeen thousand eight hundred and ninety two dollars more to add the LED lights, but we we Per year. That is that yeah. that doesn't include the offset, the elect the electrical offset, correct? Like the savings. Right. So, so the the first that year would the be okay. The and, first and year. Can we remember what the savings were if we did the LED lights? Yeah, it's eighteen thousand dollars a year. So that your payment the next year out, the okay. difference the in the LED lights. The difference in the payment would drop by ten thousand. I mean, you just you paid for it basically, is what you're saying, Jamie. In the first year, yes, the eighteen thousand okay. of the difference, and then the, the the payment difference between the two scenarios is ten grand a year. Okay, thank you. Part of this, these things are only getting more expensive. Well, I guess I do. Sorry, so there was a motion on the table. No, I never made a motion. <laughs> yeah, I was, I, about, I, I, I was I about to make a motion, and there was further discussion. So you Sorry. all are free to make a motion at this point in time. If somebody wants to, I'll make a motion, but I don't have no. anything in front of me. Hold on, hold on. I'm just gonna. Okay, you're not online. You're not on the Zoom. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I I came straight from right. the airport. That's all right. All right. I hate the number, but I don't know. Never mind. I, I, I can sense the mood in the room. Move to approve <laughs> the 24-25 Norwich School District budget in the amount of $7,946,835. Is I will second that. For all of those that weren't paying attention, that includes the lights. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. We got it, Neil. It's Thank light you. With light. <laughs> it's light with the lights. Uh, all those in favor? All those opposed? Neil and Gary, you can tell them that you dragged your board to, towards fiscal responsibility. I um, okay. I hope you are correct that that buys goodwill. Um, Me too. Now that the board has made that decision, despite voting with the minority, whatever I can do to help in that conversation, I will of course do. Yep, well, I appreciate the conversation. I, like I said, I have flip-flopped back and forth for the past four days. And I've done nothing but look at these spreadsheet numbers, trying to figure out what has gone so wrong. You all have joined me for the hardest decision I think that I've ever had to make in the entire time that I've been doing this. And, 
and to be clear, like it doesn't get any easier after tonight. No, no it's <laughs> going to get worse. No, I think Garrett, um, my only other comment we were still on the record is, um, if I tickle the recesses of my brain, one of the first things that I was taught when I worked for Vermont's Tax Reform Commission is going back to Morse Giuliani and the foundation formula that the shelf life of an education finance system in Vermont is a limited number of years. <laughs> and then it breaks and something changes. Focus less yeah. than one. And so this, this, just the stakes feels like everybody has pushed all of their chips in the middle of the table on this one. Right. So the stakes feel much, much higher. But the underlying problem of how to make it sustainable and economically viable and fair, well, we have a 60 year track record of not figuring that out. That's a hard, hard problem. And, and in our defense, we're not the only state that hasn't figured this out. Yeah. So. <laughs> Right, but we are part of the Dresden Interstate Compact, and, and I start to wonder at some point as the, the laws and the funding systems in the two states diverge more and more over time, does it make sense to consider one Dresden again um, and becoming non operating and building schools that are energy efficient and, and state of the art on the New Hampshire side of the river that all of our kids' tuition do? And <laughs> These are all discussions that I think that we need to have another evening when it's not 9.30. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's a great point, mm -hmm. right? But there's a whole host of things that go along with that. Um, essentially, what you were just asking us all is if we would be willing to step down from the school board, right? Because when you're running a non-operating district, there's not a whole lot of stuff that that board needs to yeah. do. Marion Cross is a great, a premier child care facility and preschool on the, on the Vermont side. I, I do think, though, the revenue generator. I appreciated Jay's comments in that it does feel like an existential conversation for our school. And I know there are other towns in Vermont that have had existential conversations about their school. It just feels strange to have that conversation from a position of academic strength as opposed to a position of weakness and failing in the school. Yeah. So, right. yeah. so. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's, I mean, it's going on just 10 miles up the road. Yep. Right? Yeah. Exactly. So. Well, the problem, I keep saying this, I mean, that's why I was running these numbers, and again, I woke up every day this weekend early to, it doesn't matter how much money you have, but when you're getting these tax rate increases of 10,000, you know, when you start paying these type of taxes, yeah. and the difference between what because Hanover is already very high taxes for what you know. I talked to my friends that live in Massachusetts and what they pay for property taxes. I mean, it's nowhere near this. And now we're going literally, we're going to be 40% higher. Because right now we're on par with Hanover, just for, so we're clear. I looked at the grand list, they just did a, they just had a reassessment done. I looked at what I think houses are comparable for for a few houses. Again, it was just my data. But our tax rate literally is going to be about 40% more. It's, it's, right now, we're on par. We're all pretty even, I think, if you're to look at the data that I pulled over the weekend. Except for the lack of state Except income tax. Except for <laughs> the lack of state The property data, and, that, the, this, and it's been like this at, for the past 10 years, I think. It's been pretty even across both sides of the river. This Act 127 just pushed us, and it's just this, it's this one-time bump. And I guess this is where it's hard for the legislatures because it seems like I'm not sure if people really care. I think they just think that it's a bunch of wealthy people and they can just keep paying more in taxes. And I keep, I mean, I, I've read the news and people are saying that no, no one's going to leave the state. They always say they do, but they never do. I do think that Norwich, like, I'm scared for the future of Norwich with these taxes. I don't think it's sustainable. Uh, one quick question. Do we have need to enter into executive session, Mr. Chairman? Sorry, no, I should probably, if everyone wants to get home, so we should get back to the... I'm happy yeah. to keep chatting, but we're on the record. <laughs> exactly. So, um, no, we don't have a need to uh, enter into executive session. Sorry, I moved my agendas around here. Um, not that I'm aware of that this is it. So, uh, we returned our public... Okay, so, uh, yeah, we have a motion to adjourn. I move that we adjourn at 9.36 p.m. Second. Lisa, I'll be consistent. Favor. It's unanimous. Yeah, that was unanimous. Thanks, guys. Thank, right, you. thank you. That was hard. Thank you.